Harry Lesbitt, I'm the Executive Director of the GOPT Historical Society, and welcome to our GOPT History Museum. We've been here in the Castro for just over six years, and we have an archives. It's been sort of a roaming archives, and we finally found a new home about a year ago uh, in the Central Market area of San Francisco. It's our large archives, it's one of the largest archives of queer history in the world, and we're really proud of our collections there. We keep adding to it. We actually have room for more growth. And so uh, if, especially the older people here, uh, but certainly the younger people too, I mean, we really want to capture our history and add to our collections. And we're especially focusing on women right now because, you know, the organization started uh, in the early years of the AIDS epidemic and a lot of our early collections were people that were passing um, and continue to be so actually. But we really like to have you step before you pass because then we can talk to you about it. <laughs> and, uh, and take a look and, and you can tell us about you know, what it is and where it came from. And we're also doing an oral history project now that we're uh, just starting. We just got our new video camera equipment in uh, this week. It's digital. And, uh, and uh, so we don't have to digitize it later. And, uh, and we're having a special focus this summer. We're going to be looking at uh, ACT UP. Uh, ACT UP is pretty close to my heart because I was a member of uh, ACT UP in San Francisco when I was a much younger boy. Um, and, uh, and also women. And, um, we're uh, going to be targeting women in particular to try to collect oral histories for the use of researchers and students and documentarians in the future. Um, so I'm really excited to have this job. Um, we have a lot of fun, we have a lot of events here. I just want to wave this around. It's our July uh, calendar we put out every month, the calendar of events. Uh, we have, looks like about six events, and, and an art opening uh, next month. The next one is July 6th, Thursday. Um, Jay Whitaker is gonna be uh, giving a talk uh, in conversation with somebody. And uh, she was one of Janis Joplin's girlfriends, so we really love you. Her photo as a young woman is up on, it's part of our uh, 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 Lavender, Lavender Tinted Glasses uh, exhibit from the summer of love, 50th anniversary of summer of love, up the wall here. And I was talking to Jay the other day, and uh, you know, I asked her if she was um, worried about her presentation. And she said, yeah, you know, and I said, you know, you just gotta tell your story. You don't have to prepare anything. You just tell from your own memories. That's all that it is. I said, well, they really want to hear about Janice, you know, and then like, yeah. no, just tell us your story. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so anyway, um, so we are building a new museum, and we're a nonprofit organization. Um, we have uh, several hundred members who give uh, various amounts uh, according to their ability. Um, they start at $30 for low income or students and go to $50 annually, and that gives you free access to all of our events here. Um, and you can bring a friend as well to visit the museum whenever you like. Um, so please check out our membership brochure online or up front on your way out when you pick up our calendar of events. And we're at glbthistory.org. So that's it about us. And I'm just excited to have the Dyke Codes event here. We had another Dykes event last night, so we got a lot of Dykes going on. <laughs> and uh, last night was a full house heated discussion, uh, you know, about um, activism in the 90s, so go figure, you know. Um, and uh, so I'm delighted to have you all here, and I'm delighted to be working with uh, the Queer Cultural Center in particular because I love that organization, and I love having you guys here, and I hope we work more and more together in the future. Um, and I want to introduce Jackie. Jackie's the president of the board of the Queer Cultural Center, and I'll turn it over to you. And I want to welcome you to this event, which is one of our featured events in the 20th year of the National Queer Arts Festival. So I want to see you <laughs> Thanks to the volunteers who make this happen, and of course to our founding, one of our founding members, Ann Peniston, who's sitting here tonight. Yeah. <laughs> about dyke coats tonight, but please pick up one of these catalogs on your way out there by the window where you'll learn more about other events that are happening during the festival. 
Um, even after the festival, we do have other events, including the Queer Open Studios that will be in mid-August, both on the Oakland side and the San Francisco side of the Bay. So check that out, and there's information about that in our catalog and also at our website, qcc2.org. Um, the second thing I wanted you to think about is if you're inspired by tonight's program and you're an artist, think about being part of our Creating Queer Community commissioning program. In that program, we help artists um, develop their marketing strategies, plan their program, learn about grant programming, and we have orientations for that um, CQC program on July 9th at uh, Culture Collective in Oakland, and then on July 11th at the LGBT Center. The last thing I'll ask you to do before I turn it over to tonight's program is to fill out your surveys, which you'll see on your seats. Um, filling this out helps our funders know what we're up to, if we're fulfilling our mission, and it helps us know what you'd like to see more of. So with all of that, I turn it over to Dr. Thank, Thank you. outside the bubble of a big city. Um, and so we're going to talk about that tonight a bit. We're going to share some art, we're going to tell some stories, we're going to show some art, and we're going to have a discussion too. So if you have any questions, if any questions come up during any of the performance pieces, please think about them, write them down, whatever it is you need to do to remember them, because we do want this to be a dialogue and discussion. Um, we'd love to hear your stories as well. Um, so I'm going to, because I didn't print it out, I printed everything else out, um, but I didn't print out bios. So I'm going to put my phone, I'm not just texting. <laughs>
um, and to be very young without any mentors, without any community centers, without any real community um, or role models or mentors. Um, I found a lot of my time was spent trying to figure it out. I thought that I was very inconspicuous about it and I could not figure out for the life of me why all the girls kept coming out to me. Um, I was always the one caught in the back of the locker room. <laughs> I was always the one at the sleepover who didn't know it was supposed to be more than a sleepover. <laughs> I never ever got it and I always was like, is there a neon sign on the middle of my forehead? Why does this keep happening to you? Um, I always saw myself as an ally but, and an advocate but never saw myself as a part of the community because I had no community to actually be a part of. Um, I got gay bashed a lot and I didn't have anywhere to really put it um, except into my writing and it actually helped to birth me into being a performance poet because it was a place where I could take a platform and a stage and no one could tell me no, at least not until I got done with my three minutes and 10 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it made me a stronger writer. Um, moving on to like Louisiana was um, was also a different kind of experience. Being in the deep south, not the country, Kentucky, I feel like it's country. Louisiana is the south. Um, it is deep beneath the Bible belt. And, um, I co-founded the Baton Rouge Poetry Alliance, um, which is an organization which is we're in the 17 years old now, really. um, uh, early, early on. And um, we ran the only openly uh, crossover event in the entire city for seven years. I was the only openly gay person running a crossover event, which means there were gay people and straight people, that there were cross-cultural community um, we work very diligently at having um, in the space uh, for an extraordinary amount of time. Um, and I came out quite by accident. Um, I was out in New Orleans, which is much easier to do in the on the pillars that make sure that the straight people don't go too far. Um, not a whole lot of recognition there, but uh, some friends of mine, or not friends of mine yet actually, they were often. <laughs> Caught me in the gay club. And the next time I tried to sneak in, um, this woman by the name of Kiki yelled out above everybody else, Mona Webb, I see you now! You are gay! <laughs> Like, 
like, she's a young, like they would go on and on and on, proselytizing, and then at the end they'd be like, hug me, and say, we love you, and we hate the sin, and we're going to get this demon out of it. Because eventually, clearly, I had to resign. <laughs> I like, literally wait till the place was closed and left it on the bus, and so I like, that's in the middle of the night, it's like, never mind. But, but that's kind of how you, like, how things would happen, you know? I mean, I could resign or I could wait to get fired. One of the two, what was going to happen next. Um, but, I, you know, things like uh, the Holy Spirit of the gays, or the gay spirit was, uh, was a big thing that people like to shake a tambourine at. Um, <laughs> but, like, you know, we called it in the South, the life. You know, that's how we refer, we never said we were gay. We're like, are you in the life? But that's what we would, that was our code word. Um, and how long have you been in the life? You know, because um, it's like your life didn't actually begin until you became gay. So it's like my whole gay life. Um, and who brought you into the life? And everybody wants to trace the tree. <laughs>
people talk, and well, church folk just can't with the gays, especially the Catholic ones. So many, so busy hiding, so arrested, so decidedly docile, till the lights go down on burden. The gay side, after the pillars in the middle warning the tourists not to come across this line. Make sure that you stay on the other side. But I see you, shaking hands the lesbian way, the glance and go, what we now call cruising, the die code of bracelets and cuffs, tops or cuffs on the left, and it must be leather, always leather. And the butcher, the better. I used to try real, real hard to make sure you always saw my top cuff. <laughs> make sure all the girls would know. <laughs> Even got in a fight with my best friend one night. We were trying to steal the same girl and wanted to impress at the same time, but I would not let go. And my favorite, are you failing? Pretending your, pretending your response, being told everything. How long you've been family? Who's your house? I mean, who did you grow up with? I mean, who is your dyke mother? I mean, where are your gay parents? And who brought you into this life? How long you've been here and who loved you first? As though we were all viral. Gotta trace the family tree, know each branch and each baby dyke. Your whole gay life like a do-over with pride. And with my first girlfriend, that's exactly what it was. The life, being family, is the only life I care for. You were out. Um, had like we lived in the life. Were you wrecked? Correct you. 
So the person who raped you as young dykes was the person who you, the, the first girl you kissed. My cousin later on I found out as a gay man, he, he used the word wrecked around the same time too. And I was like, was it kissing? Or he's like, oh no, not me. <laughs> That's what I knew. Uh, but it was, it was a specific time, it was this decade, it was the 80s, there was something about the 80s in Albuquerque where the word wrecked was being used. It's not used by people who, are, who were not youth uh, in the 80s. And it, it, one way or another, whether they're older or younger, when I talked to people in Albuquerque and used the word wrecked, they wouldn't know what I was talking about. So this is a specific decade. And during this specific de decade, we also had what's called the dyke whistle. And you'll, I'm not going to tell you too much about the dive whistle because the short uh, film is going to tell you more about it. But we had a whistle which was a way of finding each other. And that was dive specific and it was decade specific and it was youth specific. Um, and so that's, that's a bit of, I'm going to show you a little bit about that a little later. It's a documentary that I'm doing. Hopefully it will be like a, an hour long or so. I'm going to go back to Albuquerque and interview folks. And I've done some phone interviews and interviewed one, one person who was a teacher at the time. Um, but yeah, we're going to do more interviews, and, and I'm um, very excited to get that out. But first, before I show you that excerpt, I want to just read you uh, a couple letters that uh, happened in high school. <laughs> so Charlene, the person who shared that list with me, for some reason saved this letter that I wrote her before we were actually high school sweethearts. It was more when I was like stalking her. I was like, <laughs> She waited till I matured a bit before really dating me. We like dated for a week or so, and I was like insane about her. And then she later, like, she was just like, "All right, kid, you got some writing to do. I'm gonna go go here." And I just like followed her around like puppy dog for a long time. And then by the time I was a junior, we started dating and got got serious. So this was before that. Charlene, hey, hey there, how are you? Me? Well, I'm pretty tired. Spelled P U R T Y. Of course. <laughs> We just got in Las Vegas, we're staying here tonight, and leaving for California tomorrow. I thought about you a lot on the way up here. I was thinking of what I want to talk to you about when I get back to Albuquerque. Actually, I'm not sure if I can wait till I get back, so I'll write it and I'll send it to you, and then we can talk about it when I get back. <laughs> I just want to ask you, would you want to give it another try? Us, I mean. We can go as slow as you want to. Take it as, take it as, take, as slow as you want to take it, and I'll even quit smoking. <laughs> I miss you, Shirley. I know I didn't, it didn't last long for us. A little over a week, right? That's <laughs> <laughs> really weird. Because I usually don't fall for people that fast. <laughs> but I fell for you right away. I guess I fell pretty hard. Eh? Well, all I know is that I really, I'd really like us to get back together. And I'll do whatever it takes to make it work. Is there a chance, Sherman? If there is, okay, I understand. And if there is, will you tell me? I'd really like to know. I'll give you a call when I get back. Maybe we can talk about it then, um, and maybe even face to face. But I'll tell you one thing now. I don't want to be around the bush, okay? Okay, I better go. I'll send you a postcard from California. Okay? <laughs> She told me about it this morning, and she seemed happy about it. What did she say to you? 
I'm beginning to think that for sure she's everywhere. But then the other day she was talking about how fine that guy was at lunch. She must be by everywhere. That's pretty sad that she thinks you're everywhere. Just because she's she might be the rest of the world is automatically everywhere. <laughs> I swear she thinks everyone is everywhere. <laughs> she told me that we should have a party at my house, which is okay, but it can't be for a while unless my parents go out of town or something. Well, I'll get this back to you and then you can write me back. Hey there, this is me again. Yes, she did tell me about her little Tom, Tom was her friend. Last night when we were talking, I finally asked what she meant, uh, asked her what she meant by I love. Like, 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 like. That was her last girlfriend. She went, I love Tom. And, I, and she said, I just think she's cool. And I said, okay, then I was just wondering. And then she said, but I think you love her. And I said, no, I don't think so. And she said, and then I said, do you mean as a friend? And she said, no. And I said, yeah, right. What makes you think that? And she said, <laughs> Number Tina could do it so good. Let me try it again. 
That's the whistle. My dog still responds. <laughs> um, for some reason in Albuquerque at that time, there were so many young dykes. I don't know what it was about Albuquerque. This is a landlocked place. You know, in high school that, you know, the jocks have this wall, whoever had that wall, the stoners had this wall, we had our own wall. So, you know, there's 20 of us during breaks, during passing periods, during lunch, and everybody just knew and just don't mess with us. It wasn't just the whistle, but it was that culture, it was that community of people who knew how to find each other. During that time, a lot of people I knew were getting kicked out of their houses. We were getting bullied at school, so it wasn't easy. It wasn't like we were walking around school with like rainbow flags or whatever. We were getting a lot of crap from a lot of people. I got verbally bashed a lot. You know, walking down the hall, some job would be standing behind me. I would hear, stay away from the street girl, dyke, you know, and it was scary. And it sucked, and it was humiliating. You know, I'm not sure that I thought it was right all the time. You know, I think a lot of us really questioned it because we were being harassed with it all the time. I came out to my family. My mom was determined to change me. And I'm convinced that had she known about conversion therapy and had, and, and had access to a convert, like a therapist, um, that, that that would have been the path for me. I somehow lucked out that she talked to my doctor to ask if my doctor knew of a psychologist and my doctor was like, yeah, but I can also tell you that it's a lot safer than your child sleeping with every boy on the block. And the psychologist was actually pretty cool too. My poor mother, like, you know, she really wanted me to change. That was her, that was her explicit goal was she wanted me to change. So I really feel fortunate that I, I got to live as a young dyke. I got to live my teenage years being who I was. And even at the time, I, I really feel like I knew that that was a special thing. When I was like 15 and I came out and I started learning about the whistle, I was always just like, who started this, who started this, this is so cool, and nobody knew. But you know, there's always been code. I feel like there's always been code. As long as there have been gays, there's always been code. As we interview folks and as I meet more folks who were out during that time, I hope to see it closer to the origin of the whistle, who, who started the whistle. I'm pretty sure it originated in the Latina type community though. Right now, anyone I've talked to doesn't know, I don't know. Maybe we'll never know, but I'm hoping we find something out. I do think that a lot of people will relate to this story, especially people who came out early in the earlier days, but I also think like people who are coming out now and have different kinds of access will also get something from this story. It's always great to know our history of where we come from, and I do think this is kind of a, a new generation of old school dykes telling their story. I'm excited to preserve that and to capture it. Now all I want to know is how 
how to go. I've tasted blood and I want more. I'll put up no resistance. I want to stay the distance. I've got an itch to scratch. I need assistance. I've landed on the Rocky Horror Picture Show. <laughs> Those lyrics, that film, seem to reflect all of the sex and kinkiness bubbling up inside of me. That film spoke to my repressed desire, piqued my sexual curiosity and creativity. I was a nerdy teenager growing up in suburban Connecticut, caught between adolescence and adulting. Thick glasses, bookish and preppy, from my Peter Pan collar and plaid skirt to my bass regions. <laughs> I was in love with my boyfriend, Chip, flirted with one of my best friends, Laura, and loved my gay besties, Floyd and John, with all of my heart. I was opening up, changing. I was at a crossroads, discovering myself, growing up, and coming out. Friday nights were for double dating and making out. Laura had the car. She'd pick me up, her boyfriend Robin Toe, then we'd pick up Chip. We'd kiss hungrily in the back seat. Next stop, food in a movie, or mall in a movie, or mall and food, or <laughs> food and movie at the mall. <laughs> Those nights always ended with a secret ritual. Laura and I alone in the car, in front of my house, boys dropped off. She initiated, and I was a happy participant. It started with teasing, sexy glances usually reserved for our boyfriends, Licking lips, suggestive talk that made me giggle and made me wet. We graduated to lingering kisses and long goodbyes. It never went any further. We weren't dating. We were friends. But something was happening in that car. Saturday nights were for swirling and twirling in my Jordache jeans and red candies. John and Floyd in tow. The brook was our spot the only gay bar in Connecticut. Luckily, we were never carded. Everyone made their way to Westport to party, to be free, to be themselves, if only for the evening. Brightly colored squares pulsed and throbbed under our feet in time to the music. The smell of poppers and sweat permeated the air. I'm coming out had just come out. <laughs> and there was nothing like dancing to that song when you were actually coming out. <laughs> we would pour sweat, my glasses fogging up to the point that I couldn't see. But it didn't matter. I'd just close my eyes and keep on moving, lost and found, celebrating a freedom that I only experienced on this dance floor. The three of us came out together, to ourselves and to each other at least. Although poor Floyd had been getting beaten up after school since he was in elementary. He was femme and creative and brilliant and beautiful and always a target of the rampant homophobia that lived and thrived in our families, in our homes, in our hallways and classrooms of our schools, in our institutions, in our suburban paradise. Oh, the feeling when you're reeling, you step lightly thinking you're number one, and it's down to zero if they were leaving for another one. Now you walk with your feet back on the ground, down to the ground, down to the ground, down to the ground, down to the ground. Joan Armitrade penetrated the walls of my college dorm room, penetrated my ears and psyche. I was a theater major enjoying every moment of my newfound freedom in Western Massachusetts. If not in class, I could be found glued to my three best friends, Janine, Karen, and Dee Dee. We were black girls who had found each other on a huge, predominantly white campus, and we were crazy for one another. I had a boyfriend on the basketball team and a girl in drawstring pants who followed me around campus. 
I first noticed her staring at me at the Joan Armour Training concert. I was wearing my Joan Armour Training t-shirt, army green parachute pants, an oversized vintage men's jacket, sleeves rolled up, and strappy sandals. It was the 80s. <laughs> After that, she was everywhere I was and everywhere I looked. Somehow I had managed to land a leading role in a play at Smith College. I was a freshman attending UMass, so this was quite a big deal for me. The enemies not on safari coming to round us up in the jungle no more was a badass play. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Written and directed by the beautiful and talented author, professor, and playwright, Andrea Hairston. She was the first black lesbian feminist that I had ever met, and I had a massive crush on her. Mm -hmm. Frequently embarrassing myself in her presence. Mm -hmm. I remember building up my courage to come out to her and her girlfriend Liz one night as they drove me back to my campus. It was so awkward, <laughs> sitting in the back seat of her car, staring at the back of their heads, waiting for the perfect moment. Finally, I just blurted it out. I was met with awkward silence, followed by words of encouragement. I wanted her to know, to see me, to recognize me. I wanted her to know that I saw her and admired her deeply. Smith was utopia. Beautiful, brilliant, confident, friendly, accomplished women everywhere. And they all seemed to be smiling at me. Interest in my boyfriend was fading quickly. <laughs> <laughs> On my way to class one cold early morning, there she was, the girl in drawstring pants, who had been following me around, waiting outside my dorm. She said that she had seen me around. Well, that was putting it mildly. <laughs> <laughs> and introduced herself. Her name was Snow, and she was white. <laughs> I must admit, I was flattered that someone would follow me around for months. Although today, I, I think I would consider that stalking. <laughs> I wasn't that attracted to her, but I liked that she was bold and took initiative. I was far too shy to pursue anyone, even if I was totally crushed out. One night, Snow was waiting for me outside of a party.
love. Back in Connecticut, back to my parents' home. Grieving, confused, and feeling defeated. My dad was a professor at a local university, and I would be enrolled. Classes were a blur. I skipped most of them that first semester, opting for staring off into space and imagining a different life, imagining freedom. I would find freedom back on the dance floor, back at the brook. By my second semester, I had returned to life. I got a job at the campus library and moved into a small apartment. Theater classes provided a much needed outlet and offered opportunity for new friendships. Camaraderie could be found in my new fabulous friend, Monty, a fast-talking, well-heeled, perfectly coiffed queen from Long Island. Fun was always on the menu. <laughs> After months of listening to me moan about the lack of cute girls at the brook, hell, the lack of girls at the brook, Monty announced that he had found the perfect girl for me. I was dubious, to say the least. Saturday night at the club, we were both looking good, hoping to make that love connection. Monty disappeared and returned, declaring that she was here, the girl who was perfect for me. Something dropped inside my stomach, and I felt a wave of anxiety or it might have been pure fear. But I gathered myself rose and was off to meet the perfect girl. Through the crowd of sweating, glistening boys, Monty pointed to a girl across the room. Her back was to me. She was busy talking and laughing, surrounded by the only other girls in the club. She was wearing loose gray sweatpants, a white baseball jacket. She looked athletic, sporty. She had a very short fro, a great laugh, she turned around, and when we approached, she smiled widely at me. She was beautiful. Monty introduced us, and I'm sure I blushed. Cheryl was the popcorn and candy girl at Sono Cinema, the local art house in Norwalk, and she operated that concession stand like a well-oiled machine. <laughs> I was smitten, taking the train every chance I got to see her after my classes. She loved foreign films and would sneak me in for free. I loved it and I would watch multiple films in a row waiting for her ship to end. She lived at home with her parents and hadn't come out to her family. I lived by myself and hadn't come out to my family. Our love was growing quickly, growing sweetly, and it was time to share our love with our parents. I went first. I just couldn't imagine a lifetime full of hiding or pretending. I knew that this would be a very big deal for my family. They were not the P flag type. <laughs> but I also knew that they loved me. My family was homophobic, and I was about to face a lot of anger, disappointment, and disapproval. But it was time. I decided to tell my parents individually, mom first, then dad, followed by grandmothers, then aunts and uncles. You know how people say they knew or they must have had some sense or suspected? Well, no, my parents really didn't. <laughs> it was a shock. <laughs> and it landed like a lead balloon. My mom wept uncontrollably upon hearing the news. She was devastated. Her first words after pulling herself together were, don't worry, we'll get you help. We'll find a good psychiatrist. Second shock for mom came when I informed her that I didn't think there was anything wrong with me or being gay, and that I wasn't going to a psychiatrist. My mom got to my dad before I could and broke the news. I would have preferred to do it myself. The first thing my dad said when I sat down with him was, you're too pretty to be a lesbian. <laughs> and then he told me that he didn't believe it. I assured him that it was in fact true. <laughs> He then cautioned me that I would never find a man looking the way that I did. I informed my dad that I didn't want a man, so that wasn't really a problem. <laughs> Insult and injury. My mom became the town crier, needing to share her misery with the rest of the family. She got on the phone and went to work, telling everyone without my knowledge or my consent. People were already forewarned and forearmed by the time I spoke to them. Their disapproval, and in some cases disgust, already cemented in place. No one, no one took it well. 
Some family members simply retreated from me, just disappeared. The hardest criticism of all came from my maternal grandmother. I received a long handwritten letter in the mail that broke my heart, then crushed it. My grandmother said that she was disgusted by me, that I was, in her words, a disgrace to the family, a disgrace to womankind, a disgrace to the race. I can remember those words to this day. She went on to quote various Bible verses and shamed me for seven long pages. I had been her favorite until that moment, until the moment she learned that I was a lesbian. Now I was a stranger, an abomination, a poison, a disgrace. I would never be welcomed into my family's home with Cheryl or any other female partner. My parents told me so and they meant it. They believed that I had chosen being a lesbian over being a member of the family. Love had not been enough. Love had not been unconditional. I knew it would be hard, but it was harder than I thought. I was hurt deeply, and I would feel that pain for a very long time, but not forever. I was strong and smart. I was resilient and in love, and I was determined to live my life with or without their love and acceptance. Ironically, their rejection offered me liberation, a freedom I had never known before. I felt unencumbered, no longer weighed down by their judgments and social mores, free to be my whole self, my true self, and I grew in that freedom. I unfurled my wings, and I learned to fly. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. Um, we're just going to open it up for questions and discussion. That was, that was really... Uh, I have, I'm gonna start with I'm gonna start with questions. Sorry. <laughs> you mentioned you started seeing John Armchair and Goosebumps. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the person who met me uh, was was the, was got me to John Armchair. Yeah. I didn't like her. At first I was like, she's weird. Why are you listening to her? Because like, John Armchair is she's very different. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And uh, and but she persisted in this girl all the time, and eventually, like after we broke up, I started missing her. And I was <laughs> that makes me wonder, like, what, what, what are the music? What music? What was the soundtrack to your coming out? Because I think music really takes us places. It takes us back in time. I mean, for me, I mean, I mostly came out in Louisiana, so it was all second line. You know, I was spent a lot of time on Bourbon Street, and even when I, you know, the show that I hosted, I had a live band every week. And so we made our own, yeah. <laughs> honestly. But, uh, I, I know there was popular music at the time in the clubs, um, but a lot of it was um, techno, which I wasn't into. Um, so yeah, a lot, of, a lot of what I think of um, is, you know, the Angry Eight or the Michael Foster Project or, you know, the John Gray Symposium, like, yeah, they're all like brass bands and Louisiana money grab bands and Second Line. Um, that was the sound of our movement and of our parties. That's what we did, you know, we didn't play records or CDs, we, we had a band. <laughs> That's just always what I actually think of. And when I think of Mardi Gras, that is the first thing I think of, too.
was just a huge part of it. You know, partying with gay men, those were my best friends. We came out together because whoever the queer women were in my community, I could not, I don't know if any of you are familiar with Connecticut, but a lot of the women, a lot of straight women look butch. It's very hard to tell who's who. It's very, very hard. And the risk of exposing yourself to someone who isn't is very great. So unless someone truly showed themselves to me, I didn't know. And I didn't feel safe enough. So in the club, whoever was there, clearly, but there were so few women. I mean, there were like five of us. You know what I mean? Um, but again, for me, club music, you know, disco, and then, you know, I became a punk, so, you know, new wave into punk kind of thing. Um, but Joan Armatrading was just like that staple, you know, that go to kind of music. Yeah. I can't believe I see her live. It's mm -hmm. Oh, many times. Yeah. She's still touring, I get it. But this is like, we. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I know for like I really want to find out how much it like it's probably what I probably can't afford to get at least Lisa in the cult jam head yeah. to toe. Oh, yeah. So now uh, I'm in my movie, like it's probably the licensing is probably but um, head to toe was like a big one. And, we, and I, we couldn't get into clubs um because we were young and my friends would get fake IDs occasionally, like I said, I got snuck in to play a show, but we were mostly hanging out in the parking lots of the clubs, <laughs> listening to whatever was on our radio because we didn't have like I didn't have a cassette player in my car. Um, so it's like Lisa Lisa and Nicole Jones was the one that always takes me there. But so unfortunately, so it's like hard. How do I get you alone? Oh, yeah. <laughs> In too deep by Phil Collins. Like it was 1987. It was 1987. When I go back to the top hits of 1987, I'm like yep 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 yep. <laughs> All the songs I was making out too. <laughs> what What about y'all? Did, did, did music ideas come out? Like when you think about your coming out days, was there was there anything that you're like ah that makes me think of? Shout out names, because I want to go home and make a mixtape now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I conform to the stereotype of my day. The album was um, Chris Williamson's uh, The Changer and the Chain. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. 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 Um, my experience is I have a hard time finding a firewall to mine because I was a goth. So <laughs> already it was like nothing that I would think of as a music I used to listen to is anything that anybody I know now, even unless I knew them when I was 15, nobody knows what I'm talking about. So I don't have like, I remember being an adult and hearing Ani DeFranco for the first time and everybody being like, I mean, you didn't have this when you were coming out? No, I honestly don't know. Is it Ani DeFranco? Is it Annie DeFranco? I don't know. <laughs> During that time, when I finally figured out what I thought, for years I thought I was straight. I was the exact same outfit I thought I was I moved to New York City. Yeah, I moved to New York City now. 
coming out in Stratford? No. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think it was such a unique thing because everybody's talking about this time 
before, you know, swiping right or left. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're talking about finding community post-disco, so, you know, a little bit at the edge of disco, but pre-internet in that, you know, that position where trying to find one another if you were coming into a new place was just not that easy, you know. So, I just find all of those things fascinating as to how how we can go out and seek each other out when we don't even know where the bars are yet, or where the poetry slams that allow women to know, or you know, anything like that. So it's really fascinating. Yeah, I think that was the L bar. <laughs> 
the closest we can. And I'll add a little to that. Um, part of the reason we had to talk about that, there was no one to, to tell us anything. Um, we educated ourselves in one form or the other or another by congregating because there was no one giving us information. Um, and even till this day at that bridge, really if you want to feel like you're in a community, you still go to the world. Um, that's unfortunate. There's still no place, um, no current place of people in it. And it's still, like she said, the two same laws that we cater to the man are still the ones that are there and I've been there 20 years. But still, to this age, you go to New Orleans if you want a real sense of community. Uh, I came out of a very small rural town in Northern California when I was about 15 and a half. And just this question of how did you meet other people? There were no other people. <laughs> um, and I, I feel like I was part of that first-ish generation of people who like had the internet when it had finally like coalesced into meeting spaces. Uh, and I feel like I came out in such a stereotypical way. I, I, I met a lesbian for the first time in a Xena Warrior Princess chat room. <laughs>
question. You know, people talked occasionally, but it was never a question of like community inclusion and community having your back. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, that's something I just kind of want to add in there as far as being a smaller place where people are meeting each other in a different way. Mm -hmm. Say, as a trans person, do you identify more as a lesbian or a straight male? Or uh, how do you no. see yourself? <laughs> I, <assume you're laughs> <still alive. laughs> I, I don't identify as a lesbian. Um, I, I still embrace my past. There are, you know, and that's different for different people. Some trans guys never identified as lesbians. Some trans guys um, did once and don't anymore, um, or don't get more kind of really embrace that past. Um, me as an individual, I very much embrace my lesbian past because it's a part of who I am and I, and, and I still kind of, like I never felt like it was important to hide my lavish tattoo. Um, <laughs> and as far as my sexual orientation, I identify as queer. I'm, I'm, I'm not straight, I'm not like strictly straight, I'm not strictly gay, like I don't, I don't really see myself, I never saw part of myself as straight. I don't even, not even strictly straight, I'm not straight. <laughs> <laughs> with a lesbian woman as a straight woman? As with a straight woman? Um, I mean, I, I, my wife identifies as a dyke and I'm okay with that. Um, some trans guys aren't, and that's, that's fine. I don't care um, because um, my wife is, is queer. My wife is, like, is, sees me for who I am. She doesn't see me as a dyke. She doesn't see me as a woman. Um, but she still gets to be a dyke. And um, so yeah, I don't, I don't have issues with that. I would have issues with being with a lesbian who you know, saw me as a lesbian, or be wrong, you know, or somebody who didn't like affirm who I am, for sure. One of my earliest experiences, and this goes back to Nebraska, was with a, a trans person, and he was married, had a very beautiful wife, very beautiful daughter, and he had the full operation, became a woman, and his wife. Had become they would be wearing my sheet. I mean, they would be wearing my sheet. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I, I still have those problems <laughs> yeah. because he, so, he went so with in the past. both pronouns. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, but his wife had to become her her, 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 <laughs> her wife. <laughs> well, I knew him beforehand because uh, the only name I knew was Blaine. Yeah, was his male know. name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, when you're seventy, you forget these things. Uh, but her wife had to become a lesbian because they were very much in love and he was not attracted to men at all, although he would go to the she, she, she would go to the straight male bars and the guys would try and pick her up. And it was really an interesting dynamic because I, I was surprised that her wife then stayed with her because she was a straight woman. But she said, well, I'd rather be a lesbian with the person I love. So, interesting. I <laughs> 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 um, Like, when you think about these kinds of stories, you know, like, happening past and present and where we be in the beginning, like I was saying earlier, like, I feel like my whole gay life is a separate life <laughs> than the life that I had before I came out. Um, and, and, but they do have these places where they merge and intersect. Does anybody else have stories around those kind of um, intersections with friends or family or in community? Yeah, I just wanted to say, um, I grew up in New York City and um, I went to um, lesbian clubs and gay clubs when I was a teenager. And I know that people were talking about how hard it is to come out in small towns or communities that seem very circumscribing. But even as we were, uh, uh, you know, I had so many friends, um, we had gay click, and we were different gay queer cliques <laughs> in the high school. But one night we went to um, a lesbian club called the Duchess, which some of oh, oh, yes, oh. the Duchess! Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, we bumped into one of our teachers, a biology teacher that we had in cloth as a lesbian. <laughs> and um, we were so excited to see her as a role model, but she was terrified <laughs> that we would tell other students, high school students, and of course her bosses would find out. And that was really different from what some of her male peers, her counterparts were. 
because we had out gay male teachers who were very out and very safe, but this woman was terrified. Wow. We were saying, no, 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 we won't tell anyone, please, please, but she was in tears and left the room in tears. And none of us ever told, but I mean, we, it really showed us, if we didn't know already, what the risks were. But we'll never, I know we read, read every once in a while, my high school friends and I, we always remember that. We always remember this, this was the bar, you know, for somebody with a job at a pretty liberal high school. And, um, you know, she just felt like everything was in the balance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We actually, I'm interviewing a teacher who was um, out in high school, not out in the same way we were, we all kind of knew who each other were. Um, she didn't really hide it, but she didn't really announce it. Um, and I knew because, of her, and she got, she got shit a lot from students, um, a lot. Uh, but she, in one of the interviews, I don't know if it'll end up in a documentary, but she talked about how she made herself a promise that, and she was terrified to go teach in high school in the 80s, um, and for it to be kind of found out and, and what that meant. And she promised herself that if a student ever needed her to come out, she would. Mm -hmm. And um, and she kind of tells that story in the beginning about how um, someone came up to her and was like, did you play softball? <laughs> 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 so, um, you know, and, and that's when she started, my question was like, when did you start being young dives? When did you start coming out? Um, she ended up being a mentor to a lot of, a lot of students there mm -hmm. in a really great way. And she was one of the people who started the, the festival that uh, I was talking about. Did she use the whistle? She didn't. No, she didn't yeah. So I talked to her about it. She didn't even know about it. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and it was all around her, and she didn't even know about it. Yeah. 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 Or the word wreck. Yeah. First, I want to thank you all for your amazing stories. Um, uh, yeah, it's made me feel like I we have a history and it's beautiful, so thank you for that. Mm -hmm. And the other question I have um, is about, um, kind of like, like in the communities that you come from and in your experience in the Bay Area, like what is your relationship to mentors and, and people like either having them or being one? And what do you think of like the, the kind of flight from like more rural areas to cities? Like how does that like break or shape the communities that you leave behind? That's actually actually an excellent point because you know I don't I don't again it was very hard for me to identify who was queer in my community. Um, John and Floyd, there was no doubt, and we all saw each other, and we happened to be in high school in the same grade. But outside of that, it was very difficult to tell, you know. Um, and I think the piece about flight. Anybody that I had identified as being queer, everybody left because it was too hard. You know, I've gone back to Connecticut and there are, you know, I know queer people there now. And so they were there, but you know, it's, it's like time had to pass. I think for people to really feel strong enough and safe enough to reveal themselves um, and and things and society had to change a bit, I think, for people to feel comfortable enough to be in those communities and and show themselves um, beyond perhaps a small circle. Uh, but I do think that the piece of mentoring, I mean, I'm available to be a mentor. I don't know that people see me in that way. <laughs> I think being a mentor means people identify you as that. Do you know what I'm saying? Like I can't imagine being like, yes, I'm a mentor. It's kind of like, you know, deciding, yes, I'm an elder, blah, blah, blah. I mean, you reach a certain age, but I don't think that necessarily makes you an elder. I think it's for other people to identify, you know? Um, but I do wonder, what if I had stayed in Connecticut, you know? Um, mm. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I really like that question. Questions? I'm actually just thinking about that. Um, in my mind um, about queer mentorship because it played such a big part for me. Although I feel like when I was younger, it was, it was, I don't know if it was mentorship more like leadership because they were like maybe two steps ahead of me. <laughs> you know, my first girlfriend was a lot of people's first girlfriend. 
so poised, and she wrote this incredible, you know, the Emmys not on Safari coming around and stuff in the jungle no more. I mean, that's a mouthful. <laughs> but you know, at that time, it was really edgy, and it dealt mm -hmm. with, you know, race and gender and class and da 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 da. It was, um, it was done in theater in the round. So in a huge room, a junkyard was created. And like the audience members were all sitting on broken chairs and in trash. <laughs> like it was, it was like wild. And she just was commanding and she was respected. Um, and she was beautiful. And she didn't personally, you know, sit me down or anything like that, but it was more her example. I think in my life it's been more the who set the example or the tone, um, as opposed to someone who really said, come on, or that kind of thing. feminism, etc. Um, and so looking back, like, and she's still in my life, you know, Sonoma County, we've known each other 20, 30 years. There's one degree of separation. Um, and so our communities, you know what I mean? Our community is still so tight knit, which has its pros and cons. But, um, and she's inspired me, you know, as my mentors get older and older and, you know, get sick and such, and we start taking care of them in our, in our gay family. Um, She's inspired, well, my love for her inspired me to start a documentary called The Love Letter to Our Mentors because somebody needs to preserve these stories, you know what I mean? Like back in the day, it was word of mouth and we'd go to women's festivals and talk, but that's a little less so, it seems like, in our culture. I'm 42 and I've said I'm always the youngest in my, at our events. But anyway, um, it's, it's really in the last few years that I've looked back and thought, she was like a hardcore mentor. You know what I mean? Because she was just my friend at the time, but you don't realize the culture getting passed down to you you know, like, just by being together all the time. And what, how lucky. Like, oh my gosh, so grateful. Anyway. One question this way. I have a question so much. It's just a, a mentor story. I grew up in New York City, uh, but I came out when I was going to college in New Jersey. So I, I had sort of one foot in New York and one foot in New Jersey the whole time. Um, and I got spotted uh, by, by a couple of older women. Uh, older women, they were in their 30s. <laughs> Uh, and uh, she was. She actually ended up 
well, being, first of all, the first woman I ever kissed, um, <laughs> but also just somebody who sort of brought me into the fold because even in a city like New York City, it's very easy to get lost uh, or to not know where to go, especially if you were not into drinking. Um, uh, 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 and then the other thing was that uh, this was the late 70s. Uh, there was a lot of feminist organizing that was going on, and that was a great place to be nice. <laughs> I started working at an organization called Women Office Workers. Uh, and uh, again, there was a, an old woman, she was about 15 years older than me, who just spotted me. I didn't know. Uh, but but she, she seemed to think I had potential. <laughs> <laughs> and it turned out that she went, she got to my high school, um, and she ended up giving me all this information about all of the teachers who were but uh, it was an all-girls school and there were a lot of female teachers. Um, uh, she told me about all of the, the teachers who were lovers with each other. Um, and it was, that was just, it was wonderful to, to, um, to have that as a guy um, at, at that time. And then there was the, um, the Women's Center, which was run by a women's collective um, at my, my school. And that was also very common in the, in the 70s and, and 80s. Um, and a, a definitely a place that the dykes gravitated to. Though there was also plenty of straight women there, but um, just a, a good place to be a woman. <coughs> um, and I also wanted to tell people about this this series that's on a, a cable channel that's also a, a, a website called vice.com. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a it's called Gaycation, uh, and it's with Ellen Page, who was the star of Juno. Um, and some guy whose name I can't remember. But um, they go to different places and check out what the queer community is like there, um, uh, both inside and outside the United States. And they had a wonderful program about what it's like to be queer in the deep south. Um, they, they did a swing from Texas to, to Florida um, and talked to all sorts of people there. Uh, they also, the one that, that I just saw most recently was about being queer in India. But uh, uh, it's just wonderful stuff. I, I, I highly recommend it. Thank you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start to wrap it up here. Um, Y'all ask wonderful questions um, and answer wonderful stories. Thank you. Before we stop, I want to. What are y'all up to next? You have anything coming up that you want to plug? That you want to talk about? That you work on? The National Car Arts Festival is still going on. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 